Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy November 30th. Um, very excited for this Ask the Conservators Dead Things in the Museum episode. Um, I'm Scarlett with NEMA, joined by my colleague Heather Riggs there in the NEMA office. Um, I want to say that virtual spaces cannot replace the lands that sustain and empower us. Uh, NEMA recognizes that our organization and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society, which continues the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples throughout New England and beyond. You can use the indigenous people's land map to locate the lands where you're zooming in from today. I'm going to drop the link here in the chat and um, hopefully folks are familiar with Zoom, but if you're not, um, definitely feel free to uh, join us by video and unmute yourself to ask questions as we get rolling, but I'm going to hand it over to our wonderful PAG chair, Camille Breeze. So thanks, Camille. Hi, everybody. Um, our uh, My co-chair, Barrett Keating, can't be with us today. He's under the weather. Um, but our um, our guest today is here, Eugenie Milroy and her partner, Rachel Ehrenstein, are the two members of AM Conservation. Um, they're out of New York. They are a wonderful team, extremely active in our professional activities. And um, although I've never met Eugenie, I uh, have been following her work and um, seen her some of her uh, taxidermy and natural history work. And so that's why uh, I was inspired to ask her to join us today. Um, this was initially supposed to happen closer to Halloween, hence the dead things yeah. theme, but um, I think we can still roll with it. And so um, I'm gonna start off with a little introduction. Um, in order to be dead, you have to have been alive, at least usually. So I wanted to just remind us quickly about um, types of artifacts in our collections that we could consider dead. So we have artifacts that are made of plant material, cellulose, and those include book and paper, wood, many types of textiles, then we uh, baskets, on and on. Then we have things that are made of protein or animal fibers. That again includes types of textiles like wool, silk. It includes, um, uh, sorry, temporarily blanking. It includes um, things that are actually uh, made of corporeal bodies or human remains. Uh, it could be a taxidermy, it could be a specimen in a jar, it could be a chair made out of horn. It could be all sorts of things that are associated with animals. And then not to leave our um, other critters out of this, we do also have um, things that are in between, things like corals and um, mushrooms and mycology and things like that, which um, I have less understanding of. But uh, uh, I think there really are sort of three categories of living things. So uh, I think that we're all here today because uh, we have questions about this very fascinating uh, side of artifact. And um, so I'm going to hand it over to Eugenie and she will uh, continue this introduction. And then um, she and I will probably sort of do a little back and forth as we um, feed off of each other. But um, then please uh, post your questions in the question section. And we will just start answering questions. And then if need to, we will just start collaborating. So uh, hit it, Eugenie. Okay. So um, just uh, to kind of, you know, follow up on Camille's uh, introduction, um, if we talk about, you know, taxidermy um, or animal specimens as um, museum objects, they can be, you know, mounted as, you um, stuffed animals like we think of they could also be study skins that are more in their more natural state um they could be part of a complex system like a three-dimensional diorama or scene or they could just be on their own individually or in different kinds of groupings um the other complication with you know when we talk about the ones that are mounted is that they're not just these natural materials that were you know natural materials we're talking about skin feather, hair, bone, uh, wood, there's also, they're mounted sometimes on modern materials such as, you know, foams and polyurethanes and resin, fiberglass, and then they might have glass eyes and like they're very complex paint, you know, so they end up being very complex objects for a conservator to approach sometimes. There's a lot happening um, and they can incorporate uh, bone and, you know, teeth, ivory, bone, tusks, um, antlers, uh, you know, so all these different materials are very interesting and fascinating, but um, can be problematic. 
So Eugenie, would you mind mm -hmm. telling us about that project you did with the dioramas? I believe it's the Natural History Museum in Philadelphia, is that right? I'd be interested in knowing um, maybe what were your concerns heading into that job? Yeah, so um, uh, uh, Rachel Ehrenstein and I um, have a background um, at uh, American Museum of Natural History is where we both started out, but we did not there particularly work on, we worked in the anthropology department and we didn't only work on the dioramas that you think of, um, but we have done two big diorama projects uh, in uh, Pennsylvania area. One was yeah, at the um, Academy of Natural Sciences uh, in Philadelphia, and then another was at the State Museum of Pennsylvania in Harrisburg. And the ones at the State Museum of Pennsylvania were a bit older diorama, I'm, I'm sorry, newer dioramas. They were done in the late 50s, early 60s, which was, you know, incorporating more <laughs> unusual modern materials than the historic dioramas at the um, Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, which are some of the older, you know, older ones that we have in our country. Um, and really from the heyday of, well, they're, they're, their dioramas span a large area, but they, uh, many of them are from the real heyday of, of diorama art, um, artwork. So some of the things, I mean, it's just a, a fascinating area of, um, to work in because you have, you know, both the uh, curved and painted backgrounds, you have what they, we call the foregrounds, which is kind of like everything else besides then the taxidermy specimens. So it's the, the painted backgrounds, which are muralist uh, worked on. That would not be something that um, we as objects conservators would uh, would approach, but, but the foregrounds, which are plant materials, um, they're sometimes actually preserved dried plant materials, and then other times they're recreated from uh, wax, uh, wax impressions that were made from the original, so. It's a, what kind of equipment or uh, personal protective equipment did you need to use when working um, with um, specimens like this? Yeah, so for for that, we were fully suited um, in Tyvek suits with PPE. We even, uh, because that collection is part of Drexel University, um, and they had a very strong health and safety department who uh, were able to... Um, take samples from, you know, we unfortunately, there are some uh, toxic materials that were used both in the taxidermy, uh, in the under layers, um, in the paint layers, there's also asbestos was often involved in the creating the foreground scenes, you know, the um, uh, groundwork and the different building up the different materials. So, um, so we did have to protect ourselves with Tyvek suits and, um, masks with the proper particulate and airborne filters. And we had, they set up, it was very uh, high tech. They set up a an airlock for us to go through every time we went in and out of the space. Uh, not, not really an airlock, but it looked like a, you know, it was like an enclosed section. There wasn't any um, mechanical doors involved. It was plat, it was, you know, thick layers of uh, polyethylene, but it was kind of exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and we couldn't uh, transfer any of our materials throughout the museum. They were very careful in that case. Um, you know, it's just something to be aware of. Lead, mercury, arsenic, all of these wonderful things and asbestos were, you know, part of what was used in building these dioramas. Right. So those of us that have taxidermy in our collections, we can anticipate that there could be exposure to these materials if we spend a great deal of time uh, touching, moving, uh, disrupting, or um, indeed sort of teaching using these, these materials. So um, I would like to discuss uh, what we should put into our policies if we have these in our collections, just to make sure that um, the objects are properly treated and that people understand the risks and limitations with uh, being in contact with them. And, and some of the uh, things we should do to do our uh, collections care of these objects. How often should they be cleaned? How should they be cleaned? Uh, things like that. So um, maybe uh, you could talk about, and, and I wanna acknowledge that these are things that are not just on exhibit, but they're also in our display areas. So do you think that um, taxidermy specimens uh, should be kept in their own section of our storage areas? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think that they should be. I think they should. And also, I mean, not just, yeah, for, for many reasons, also for to do with pests, you know, the potential for museum pests, and they are very um, delicious for many uh, insect <laughs> pests and rodents and things. So that's something to, to be aware of. Um, yeah, I think it's important to, you want to keep the dust and debris off of things so you can reduce how often they need to be cleaned. So if you can keep things enclosed in cabinets or covered in some way, that is helpful. Um, and uh, be aware that when you're handling them, um, you don't want, I think we kind of assume that things that are in better condition and look better probably have been treated with arsenic and other um, materials to deter the pests. So there's a, so you want to be extra cautious in those cases. Um, Wait, so we, that's a really good point you made. So if we have two items in our storage, in our collection rather, one looks tattier and one looks healthier, <laughs> it actually could indicate that pests have been more attracted to the tattier one. And so um, it might have fewer toxins in it. And the one that looks better has been uh, less attractive to pests and so might actually be more of a risk to us. Yeah, I mean, we could say that. I think we try to assume that everything could potentially have been treated, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's sort of what has borne out when people, um, you know, when, I mean, because when you're doing a large taxidermy project, there's often, um, you know, monitoring. We, you know, we try to monitor and see what we're being exposed to and if there's any, um, evidence of that but yeah yeah so keep that in mind <laughs> but in any case I think caution is always better you don't have to wear a full Tyvek suit every time you encounter a taxidermy object and I think you know with these diorama this diorama project you know, we were disrupting what was there like speaking of the asbestos and things like that so it's how much you're kind of potentially moving around and I don't know. So it's hard to recommend we, while we like to keep things clean, like I said, and you want to keep the, the dust and debris off the mounts. We don't really recommend doing a DIY treatment um, because it's, uh, you know, because of these health issues, but also, you know, things can be uh, unstable and you may not realize it. It's really, we really recommend having a conservator um, clean any taxidermy in your collection. I noticed that we have a question from one of our fellow conservators, Meg Geis Mooney. And um, Meg, like me, has probably in, um, been asked to clean taxidermy because uh, as textile conservators, there is just a small bridge to cross over to, um, to other organic materials. And um, uh, what I've done in the past is um, use a particulate mask, work in a large open area with good airflow and used a HEPA filtered micro vacuum um, to reduce particulates up from the surface of pieces. These happen to have been in a fire. And so I was concerned with getting um, deterioration products that were carried in those airborne particulates off of these pieces and then quickly get them out of my studio. So um, I wonder whether you can add to that in terms of um, what uh, simple things you might recommend to those of us who do have more skills more experience with this to make sure that we don't omit important things that we would do to, to surface clean taxidermy? Um, I think, you know, we use, to clean taxidermy, we would use many of the same techniques that a textile conservator would use, um, you know, brushes, uh, vacuuming through a screen or another kind of material just to um, reduce the uh, potential for loss of hair on pieces, you know, fur pieces. Um, definitely a HEPA vacuum. Um, some other things we would use, like when you have a, uh, when you have a piece that's been in a fire, we do sometimes use the soot removal, um, the non-vulcanized sponges, the soot sponges or pet hair sponges, they can be very effective. Um, various wipes, um, some, you know, sometimes solvents, depending on testing, um, such as isopropanol, but we'd have to try it first. But I think, yes, definitely, um, you know, wear your, your mask, wear your gloves, and you start with the dry cleaning as the dry cleaning and brushes and preening, you know, it depends if you have feathers or fur, but um, 
sometimes like when you have something in a fire, if it is stable, things can really get down toward the, the skin and you wanna make sure you get, you know, you get everything off um, the length of the, this, the hair, <laughs> so. I have two follow-up questions for you. Um... And they're going in two directions, but I'm going to save them so you help me remember not to, not to forget. Um, before we leave the subject of fur um, and go on to other remains, such as human remains in our collections, I wanted to say that I have a, a collection of items from the Perry McMillan, Art, Perry McMillan Arctic Museum at Bowdoin College, a longtime client of mine. They built themselves a new building. And they are putting um, new Arctic pieces on display, and I'm building the mannequins. So we have a uh, caribou seal skin, polar bear, um, and other um, materials like that, that we are going to be handling, doing a little bit of stabilization, and then um, you know handling to build these support mannequins so they go on um, relatively long-term display. So um, I uh, would love to know what you recommend um, I do to safely handle these because they're really not terribly different from the ladies fur coats, the you know fur trimmed men's coats, the the muffs, the gloves, things like that that we find in our our costume collections. And what should we look out for, and how should we um, protect ourselves? Um, you know, again, you said they're newer artifacts. Oh, no, they're uh, hundred years old. Oh, okay. You know, again, just be aware that things could have been treated with. Um, uh, it's various fungicides, insecticides. Um, I think look for any areas of, you know, instability and make sure that they're supported. Do you mean in terms of like how you support them on the mount or how you handle them? I think it's kind of, you know, things that are made into a, a garment will have the same concerns that you would have with other um, uh, clothing pieces. And I think that just beyond these safety issues. Um, I think you want to, um, you know, treat things in the same way you would, you know, they're not that different. If I see active fur slippage, which is the fancy term I've learned for hair yes. loss, I like yeah. that term, fur slippage, um, is that, uh, and say I was going to be putting the exhibit of fur coats up in my historical society, yeah. is that something that is, is it better for me to handle these objects in a uh, higher humidity environment rather than sort of New England winter 20% winter relative mm -hmm. humidity? Or uh, are there any other environmental concerns for storage and display of fur objects? Yeah, I think, you know, you don't want to get as low as 20% and you don't want to high when you start to get to, um, you know, 65% and above, you, you, these do have a high risk of mold, um, mold growth, as well as if there are, if something is on exhibit and it has this deposition, some normal deposition from the museum environment, uh, you can start providing a nutrient source for the mold. And um, so you do want to keep the humidity down. It's not ideal to be above 65 and, uh, you know, 20 is getting really low. We have, a lot, you know, the parameters are, <laughs> you, you know, in a historic home, we're not going to have that tight and we don't need to have the, you know, 50% RH, 70 degrees, like that's not a thing, kind of a thing of the past, but you still want to keep from those extreme fluctuations, you will have concerns. Sure. And the slippage, you know, ideally something that already has slippage, you want to keep you want to limit the time of exhibition or perhaps choose something that is more stable for exhibition because you're going to have further risk of light, you know, cumulative light damage, uh, light induced damage and um, other concerns. So that's exhibit. Oh, I see that somebody else that's on ha also has things from a polar exhibition. Uh, that's so wonderful. Uh, also, things like whaling museums, they have a lot of these um, really fantastic array of animal materials in their collections that we would not necessarily think of. And um, I'm very much drawn to these exotic organic materials as a conservator. I think that's part of what I do. And I think that the, perhaps the first thing that comes to mind when people think about dead things in a museum are dead people in museums. 
And that brings us to the fascinating popular topic of mummies. I have experience working in Peru with um, funerary bundles. Um, and there are many in the United States uh, because of the popularity in the last hundred years of excavating from places like China, Egypt, Peru that have the highest levels of preservation in the archeological context due to these climate um, areas. So uh, the things I work on are, are very dry. And so the chance of microbial activity is pretty low. They're also fragile in a way that um, makes them usually entirely candidates for a conservator to work with. But there are, are instances where perhaps something has already been stabilized by a conservator. It is in our collection and we have questions about caring, ongoing care that would fall into the responsibilities of a collections manager. And so um, I'm wondering whether there, uh, you could talk a bit about how the organic and the non-organic materials like uh, sarcophagi that support a, a, a mummy, for example, like what are your experience working with these complex um, things and what additional information you might provide? Yeah, so I mean, again, they are, as you say, complex and they can include, if they include an outer sarcophagus or um, you know, an inner, they could include many different materials from wood to plaster, to the textiles, to paint, to gilding, you know, depending what culture um, we're talking about. Um, so I think, you know, it's about the keeping, you know, taking care with your storage and exhibit environment and really going to the most sensitive material that you have there. And so if you have, uh, you know, you don't want any, again, fluctuations and you want to be aware that you could have um, the light and, and environmental damage to um, uh to the most the most sensitive parts of it. So I think, yeah, it's very different from dealing with something that's just, you know, one one material. So. Would you say and that I, um, less is more when it comes to addressing maybe accumulated particulate matter that we might notice on our um, human remains collections uh, that it would would somebody, for example, create a policy of uh, surface cleaning like once a year? Or do you think that, uh, that um, it's better to sort of do nothing and then bring a conservator in to look at something like once every five years? What might you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I think you want to keep track of the of what's accumulating on the surface, but I would recommend a conservator to treat um, these kinds of objects to even for the cleaning even. Um, but I would also say you should be aware, you know, when we speak about mummies, this is a, an issue right now um, that's becoming more and more prevalent, the ethical issue of, you know, if it does, if it's a human. <laughs> human remains as opposed to, a, you know, there are animal mummies as well. I think that that is something that we can't really just overlook. We have to. And there was a, I think it was RISD that had um, a recent, I saw a recent blog post about it. I think it was like the unsettling history that was discussing this topic. So I can check We that don't out. necessarily think of the connection with a, a pre-Columbian mummy or an Egyptian mummy to the things that we're learning um, that are associated with NAGPRA, the North American Graves and Repatriation Act. Um, but I see that uh, the things that NAGPRA is teaching us are starting to extend beyond North America into other parts of our collection that have uh, similar ethical responsibilities. And I think that we're moving in a good direction as an industry and uh, we'll all just keep learning more and more. Um, yeah, about that. it's really interesting because um, when I started out in the 90s, NAGPRA, you know, it was, there was a lot happening and there were positions in, you know, at the Museum of Natural History and um, other museums that were specifically dedicated to fulfilling the requirements of NAGPRA and helping facilitate that. And it wasn't even, you know, 
these issues have taken so long to catch up with the, you know, that the rest of the world also, uh, not just um, our country. So I think this is something that um, we, yeah, we definitely have to be informed about and um, think about in a new way. So this whole issue of decolonizing the museum is very, very uh, interesting. Yeah. Maybe we can do a NEMA presentation on it someday. <laughs> I wanted to move on to specimens. We recently had a talk at the NEMA, um, NEMA conference from a team at Shelburne about, um, well, what's in that bottle? And that got me thinking about specimen jars. And um, the two questions I would have about them that might be helpful to our listeners are, um, what to do if we break a specimen jar? How would we clean that up? And what would a specimen gone wrong look like? How might, say, a leaky container change appearance that we might notice as a collections care people? Hmm. Yes. Well, again, you know, cleaning up, I think it's important to uh, protect yourself um, in, because you don't really, especially if you don't know what, how it was preserved, um, what, what liquid it could be alcohol, it could be a various kind of alcohol, it could be a formaldehyde, you don't, you know, if you don't have an awareness of that, then wear your uh, PPE, and if you have a um, disposal, you know, proper, uh, if you have a health and safety disposal program, um, I would follow the guidelines for hazardous material uh, of anything you've been cleaning up, um, and a specimen gone wrong, I mean, you can kind of, <laughs> If you're, if you, you can see if your liquid is too low, you'll see changes, you'll see um, cracking, drying, deterioration. I think it's kind of, um, you would know it if you see it. <laughs> yeah, I think and coloration um, depends what kind of a, you know, what the specimen was to begin with, but. I don't know a specialist, but if you contact a conservator, one of us would um, either know a conservator who would know how to deal with this, maybe to renovate or um, rehab a specimen. But I think we also might um, find reach out to people at universities um, and facilities that are still actively creating specimens. Um, and uh, you can do some of that legwork if you have concerns about specimens, but- um, um, For the web specimens, yes. I mean, we've worked with, with places where they have a program of systematically going through and topping off or, you know, more or, or replacing if need be, you know, entirely replacing. And we do have resources that you can share about that. I'm going to have to look up, um, look up some uh, citations for you. But maybe if you, if um, listeners do have a question about that, they could um, reach out to NEMA and NEMA will forward you to us and we can help you um, you know, with challenges that have to do with that. Yeah, happy to. Camille, we did have a question in the chat. It looks like somebody did ask, is it safe preservation-wise to continue to keep all the small pieces of linen mummy wrappings in the bottom of the coffin as they were in the 1890s? I'm sorry, was that um, sort of broken off fragments or was that uh, just things that are still intact? Uh, feel free to unmute if you want to, um, or you can type whatever's easy. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, the mummy was unwrapped in the 1890s. So there's just tons of the wrapping fragments that are in the bottom of the coffin. Um, I, you know, I just, I mean, they've been there for, of course, well over 100 years, as far as we know, right? But um, I just thought, you know, I wonder if that's really. Um, you know, is there any interaction between that and the, you know, the interior of the of the coffin? Or we have the um, the the body of the mummified woman crated separately, and the two halves of the coffin crated separately. So there's three crates all together. Such a common conundrum we have between retaining original or in this case, historic information as, it, as we receive it 
and intervening and taking an active role in uh, improving preservation. So uh, maybe Eugenie, you could address some um, Adrian's questions. Yeah, I mean, I think I think this comes down to like uh, in, institutional policy thing. But as a you know, from a conservation standpoint, it's okay. Is this the best preservation environment for these linen wrappings? No, but it's part of the artifact, and this is where uh, you know it, it's part of the history and the the function of of the artifact. So I think whatever preservation concerns, and as a textile person, I don't know if you have concerns, but whatever preservation concerns there are, I think are less important than this being kept uh, as, as it is where it's supposed to be. So I would not recommend rehousing these pieces separately, but again, it, it's a, it could be an institutional decision. Okay, th thanks. I mean, I'm more inclined to to that too. I think that's part of it of the the story of us having it. It was the scientific society who you know received this and and decided what they needed to do was unwrap it. So, sure. Yeah, and you can't you can't go back in time, right? So, assuming you already have addressed sort of the climate in which these pieces are to mitigate extremes. What you're left with is this puzzle. You've got a, a, probably a cellulosic wooden coffin with cellulosic linen fibers in it. And these acidify over time, especially when they're all just hanging out with each other in a general environment. And so what's gonna happen is at least they're away from the, the protein materials in the, in the mummy itself, but you're gonna notice things uh, just coloring and yellowing over time, but what you don't realize just looking at them is that anything from vibration to handling might take what looks like an intact piece of woven linen. And you might find it so brittle that it just will uh, powder something I call the eyeshadow effect, which is um, really silk related. You run your finger across it and, or you're handling it and you see sparkly um, dust on your finger. That's all signs that if you were to continue to manipulate or, um, or rub against these objects, they will literally turn to dust in front of you. So the uh, even a well-intentioned surface cleaning of something like this could um, cause irreversible uh, release of particles, destruction of what woven textures, all that kind of stuff. So um, if you do not have a pest problem and there's not something you're actively addressing, like a mildew problem, then um, I think not touching it is what a conservator would tell you if they came to look at your your objects. Yeah, it's um such a conundrum. Okay, Th thank you. That's that's really very helpful. Appreciate that. Of course. That's Are there other questions? Less is more. I like the eyeshadow effect. I haven't yeah. uh, heard your term. That's a good <laughs> good one. Yeah, that's what we say. We ask like like uh, when somebody does a condition report. Um, there'll be like no eyeshadow in the notes. Oh, that's so good. Then I get yeah, to and those here. contents don't have a different requirement that, yeah, no eyeshadow. So glittery <laughs> eyeshadow or? <laughs> yeah, it's glittery silk. And, but you, you can get the same thing from, um, from plant fibers too. And um, it's, uh, it's a fascinating thing to read about the technology and production of these materials and how that impacts what they look like. And these are the desired characteristics that we want out of them. Like, um, but some things are really exotic. Barrick was telling me that Boston a hundred years ago had this thriving industry of furniture made from horn. Some of us might have seen these in our collections, big ornate chairs or stools, things like that. Now the horn he said came from down South and uh, like Southern states, but that the pieces were actually made in Boston. So uh, he treated a, a chair made of horn because it was in a flood. So the bottom parts of it were wet for a long period of time, which can happen in one sudden event, or it can be something we discover after long time exposure to say a cement floor, something like that, where moisture has no place to go. So anything organic will, will absorb it. So um, I'm curious if uh, I found something made of horn, whether it is just a powder horn or something larger. Uh, could you talk about what these materials are 
and uh, what, what considerations they need. Yeah, so these materials are um, keratin based and they're basically like compact hair. And so they have kind of, they are very susceptible to water damage and high humidity, as you mentioned. Um, you know, it can cause cracking and def deformation. Um, they're also susceptible to mold and mildew upon, you know, when they're wet and then as they're drying. So I think, you know, it's keeping the environment as stable as possible. Like if these things got like keeping things elevated, especially in your storage, always like off of the off of the floor, keeping them out of if you have any micro environments, um, you know, protecting and covering things when you can to prevent um, surface you know stuff gathering on the surface so again you don't have to clean them as much i think you know it's kind of many of the same things we've spoken of with other organic materials um you know and when they're attached to wood or to other kinds of things and then they're sometimes metal fasteners um that's another thing you want to just be you know be aware that at the points of attachment they can be weak they can be weak at the tips um you know, handling, make sure you handle things by the most, you know, stable part. Um, it's kind of, we, you know, similar to what we're seeing in other, other materials. You just reminded me of something. Um, storage materials are always a, a big topic of discussion. So if I had, uh, perhaps I had a, a chair or a piece of taxidermy, and I've, I've got it on an appropriate support, and I want to cover it, I've got a choice, either a lightweight, very permeable cover like acid-free tissue, or do I go in the other direction and I do something like polyethylene sheeting or Tyvek or a material like that that has more potential protection from water leaks or depositions of plaster falling from our old storage area? Like, how do we know which direction to go in in terms of our, our covers? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it depends on what you're covering, but if you know that your space has susceptibility to leaks or potential leaks, I think you want to go with the polyethylene sheeting. Ideally, you would have things on storage furniture or in storage furniture. Um, you could have shelving, cabinetry, you know, these kind of bigger item, bigger picture things going down to the smaller, you know, we start with you know, a foam support and then a box. And then we get, you know, get bigger and bigger into the the store, the storage furniture, and then, you know, your storage, uh, storage cabinets and rooms. So I think, you know, the tissue can be helpful in a pinch, but then you can't see what's below it. One thing, the advantage you have to the plastic is that you can actually see what's going on under there. Um, what we don't love is like when things are, you know, wrapped up in tissue, um, and then like a label is stuck on the tissue, and then we're, uh, we can't really see the object. And then in order to actually give put eyes on it, we have to go through this unwrapping and handling process. So I think if you can support things in a way where you don't have a lot of wrapping in terms of objects, it, it can be helpful, you know, and always support things by their base and just kind of the general handling guidelines. That's an excellent reminder. I, I hadn't thought of to talk about um, sort of how our storage method, which of course is something that conservators and all other collections people, we all meet on this storage topic. We're all involved in it. Um, how that is a part of protecting our artifacts. So. But when you say also plastic sheeting, we wanna make sure it's you know, polyethylene sheeting or another kind of a tested um, conservation approved material as opposed to, you know, as you know, things get left in, you know, you get your fur coat that comes in a dry cleaner bag that fall, falls apart in your hand because of the plasticizers and the, I'm yeah. sure you've seen as, that. <laughs> as, as a reminder to everybody, the two plastics that you can confidently use within your environment uh, are polyethylene and polypropylene. Um, that that goes all the way from a polypropylene, corrugated polypropylene or chloroplast storage box uh, to just polyethylene sheeting you buy at the hardware store. These are safe materials. 
whenever possible, use ones with no color, either transparent, translucent, or white. And um, remember that these materials have a static electric charge when they are moved around. So if you have a choice between a polyethylene storage box for a fur coat and a, maybe an acid-free cardboard box for a storage of, of fur, you might consider putting it in the paper product because then you don't have that. If you have a high humidity situation, the problem with a corrugated polypropylene box is that it um, is slower to buffer. So if you have a really hot, humid summer condition, those conditions remain longer in that box. So it might be a little more conducive to microbial activity. Um, yeah, you don't want can. to create, you don't want to create a microclimate <laughs> with your plastic sheeting. Um, so you could, when I said plastic sheeting, I, I was imagining you would have your shelving unit and then you could cover the shelving unit in case you were worried about water, um, water coming down, like on a taxidermy mount or something, but that's a good point about the, yeah, I mean, that's it. That's the funny thing, right? Like you, you don't want to end up with, um, a box, if you have an emergency event, you don't want to see a box filled with <laughs> water and, con you know, condensation, but, um, but you want to be able to protect, you know, we've seen some horror, yeah. horror stories of. Yeah, uh, a protection can become, can become a, a double-edged sword. Yeah. Or uh, we, we have some things that were in a flood that uh, were in perfectly good acid-free cardboard boxes. And they definitely were better than nothing, but um, we've one customer taught us that the pieces that were on a sheet of um, Volara, Volara is an expanded polyethylene um, material, ethylene Volara. They're both uh, these safe foams to use, and Volara is just the name brand for the stuff that comes thin in a sheet on a roll. Sometimes you see it in your Amazon packages. Well, this material was put in these boxes um, because these were heavy beaded dresses and they thought that it would be a nice uh, padding for these dresses. Um, for some of us, that's an extra expense, but um, it was a, a very insightful decision they made because when this flooding uh, happened, they found that that created a barrier and that the water went below that and soaked the box and the pieces that were on Volara had much less damage. Than the pieces that were not on Valara. So interesting case study. Um, do all of us have the funds to go and um, add a layer of Valara to every single box that we pack? Um, some of us can. Certainly, if we're talking about packing objects, uh, then uh, the foam becomes more of an essential way to either compartmentalize within a box or protect heavy or fragile pieces. Um, but I thought that was an interesting anecdote and um, something to think of. Obviously, if you're going through these efforts to protect your objects from uh, emergencies, you would only do them if you've already done the work to, to um, protect your, your macro, your macro micro mm -hmm. here, and um, put your money first into making sure that your building as your most important envelope is stable. But we also have to plan for unexpected things, with, uh, especially with climate change. Yeah, and you know we do our best for the building, but sometimes you have a historic site or you know a building that you you know you're you can't control every you know every part of it, so you put things in the best possible storage space within what you have. Um, but if you have to, uh, these these are interesting little like micro solutions. So adding that layer of Valara is like the way we say raise things off the floor, right? You're raising it off the floor of your box, and you're creating a support for potentially lifting, you know, lifting out of the box when something is uh, or yeah. So so much to consider. Scarlett, can you um tell me if anybody else has had a question? I haven't seen anything come through, but if folks want to unmute yourself, feel free to unmute and ask your question. I know we only have, uh, you know, 10 or so minutes left. So definitely, if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself. It's funny, but these are the conversations that um, we geeks have with each other, like, you know, at the bar of the conference hotel and, uh, <laughs> you know, at coffee breaks at NEMA. So, um, I really like these Ask the Conservator sessions because I feel like we can all share our, our fears, our concerns, our anecdotes, our worst case scenarios in, um, 
and also sort of just geek out on stuff. And these are sometimes the reasons we got into museums because uh, a certain type of artifact really fascinates us. And I think that um, that's definitely been a, a thing for me with, um, with the dead things. Looks like we do have a question in the chat. Someone asked, are you ruling out Mylar as a protective film for artifact contact? Yeah, you know, um, Mylar is used a lot in um, archival work, I know, and archival in um, with uh, photographs and other kinds of paper-based material storage. We tend to, in objects and, you know, some of the things that Camille was mentioning with, uh, you know, with the static <laughs> potential for plastic on uh, fur or hair materials, uh, we don't tend to use mylar in, uh, in storage this very much um, for objects, like for 3D objects. It's just also not something that we, you know, we tend to use the foam and the velara and Tyvek. Um, so, but it is clear. So I don't know. What What about you? For textile, do you typically use mylar? I would say the number one use nowadays for mylar for us has been um, for safe exhibitions. So if you have a dress with a train and it's going on exhibit, mylar is the least visible uh, way to um, cover your floor in the area where the train is going to be. Um, so. I use mylar or recommend mylar more in an exhibition context as an invisible, undetectable barrier. But uh, since mylar was all the rage, we have a lot of new materials for bar barriers like uh, Tyvek, which again is plastic, so it still has a static uh, issue, but um, is more malleable and softer and can be taped to things more easily. Or uh, other high tech barriers like Marvel Seal, which is an aluminum, nylon, and polyester product, um, which has the benefit of you can heat seal it to itself. So sometimes we have sort of evolved away from mylar. But um, oh, another thing about mylar is when you cut it into shape, the edges are kind of sharp. So if you were handling uh, fabrics with mylar supports, there potential exists for actually tearing. So uh, I would say if you have a roll of mylar in your collection and you want to use it because you spent important money on it, then you should maybe make a policy of where to use it first. And encapsulation for paper products is a great use of mylar. And you can use double stick tape like on the outside of your envelope, archival double stick paper, or these other techniques we're familiar with, interleaving paper products within a box, um, or maybe uh, stabler objects. I, I could see maybe textile fragments. You could stack sheets of mylar within a box to help with lifting. So um, just double check when you're using it. And uh, your common sense might tell you, I think I'm going to go to acid-free tissue or something like that. But I'm curious, David Colglazier, our friend, um, why you're asking, do you have any uh, either nightmare scenarios or extra successful uses of mylar that we haven't talked about? No, I don't have any nightmare scenarios, but you were listing materials and you didn't include mylar as a chemical agent as you did polypropylene and polyester, I think, and polyethylene, polyester, um, I forget what else, but anyway, a, uh, oh, yeah, you didn't include uh, mylar itself. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. yeah, so it is, as you know, as Camille said, it is a, a considered a safe, inert storage material, but it's not our first choice for the kinds of collections that we work on. I think if we were paper or photo conservators, we'd be saying, yes, put everything in mylar envelopes, or <laughs> I think they do a lot of rehousing still in, in yeah. mylar sleeves. So we use it in treatment you know, for sure, so. That's right, yep. If you have a, a roll of any kind of plastic in your, uh, in your possession and um, you think it's a little old and it's yellowing, yellowing in plastics is a really good sign that you should dispose of it. It's probably got something in it that we don't want anywhere near our collection. Otherwise, if you see yellowing on fabrics or other organic like cellulose products, means they're acidifying. Maybe it's your environment something's been stored in for a long time. Maybe it's been sitting on something wood. 
again, it's a, it's a good sign that you should you get a second opinion from a colleague, but um, it might actually have just aged out and it might be better to replace it. So when you do buy a brand new roll of acid-free tissue, make sure that you're keeping it on a barrier material or in a barrier material um, so that you aren't accidentally sort of um, shortening the lifespan of that usable material for you. And another thing I wanna add, sort of a good way to sum this up is uh, to remind you to, except in the case of pest, uh, water, some other kind of emergency scenario, it's best to do nothing when you have a question, slow down and get some information. Don't um, sort of jump in and address something if it's not an emergency, because sometimes we, we might put a little time into something and never get back to it. And we leave it sort of half done, half addressed. Um, just not doing nothing is better than jumping in, in and doing something. Um, you know, have some time to think on it, address, uh, address it with a conservator or another colleague and, um, and just take your time making your decisions. Any other questions? Eugenie, what can you uh, say for us as a, a little end to your visit with our NEMA friends? Yeah, well, I agree. Um, I agree with the do, the do nothing thing. And I just think there are so many interesting um, materials that have been used uh, in these, uh, in all kinds of ways. And it's just fascinating to kind of, you know, when you, when you in, experience a new object you haven't seen before um, to really look closely and try to to figure out what you know what it is and how it was put together and I think we love doing that and that's why we're conservators and you know I hope that uh, you know I hope you guys also look, look at taxidermy and don't say ew <laughs> you uh you know can appreciate there is a lot of artistry and that's another that's another uh webinar or zoom call but uh but there's a lot of artistry done um, there as well. So, can you tell us what your um, website is or what your email is? Yeah. So um, my company is called A as an Apple M Art Conservation, um, and I can be reached at my name Eugenie at amartconservation.com. Um, and our website is we haven't <laughs> updated it too much recently, but it's uh, you know we do have a website with some projects and uh information on there and um feel free to email me with any questions about any of this or things that didn't come up that uh you were thinking of and be happy to hear from you great uh you can reach me camille at museum textiles or you can visit museumtextiles.com with any questions and also we want to let you know that if you're looking for a conservator you can go to uh the web page for the american institute for conservation which is um culturalheritage.org, find a professional. Um, sometimes, some places it says find a professional, some places it says find a conservator. They're um, trying to include more, um, collections care as part of our network, but um, those will lead you to a search engine that will help you find somebody in the material that you're interested in, in the region that you're interested in. And of course, um, Nemanet. Um, Oh my gosh, I'm like nemanet.org. <laughs> yep, exactly. I just dropped the links in for Eugenie and Camille um, and AIC and the NEMA Marketplace. So okay. Oh, and you know, I, I will share it with NEMA, but I, I was thinking um, when we were talking about the fluid specimens, the other place to look um, is the Society for Preservation of Natural History Collections, um, Spinach. I think there's a lot of uh, resources there. Well. Oh, and if you've never been to the Muta Museum in Philadelphia, <laughs> that is the headquarters for <laughs> dead things. So give it a go. It's a great experience. <laughs> well, thank you, Camille. And thank you, Eugenie. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. And we look forward to the next Ask the Conservators. Have a great day. Okay. Thanks, everyone. You can always recommend topics. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.